Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another World of Warcraft Classic Guide. My name is Cargos, and today I'm very excited to share with you this comprehensive rogue leveling guide for World of Warcraft 1.12. There's a lot of stuff I want to go over. I want to first start off by giving you my general impressions of rogue leveling. I'm going to present two different talent builds for you. The first one's going to be a more straightforward combat swords build. The second one's going to be a front stabbing build where we just min-max out the backstab. Then we're going to go over rotation, talk about how that rotation is going to vary throughout different stages of the game. You know, from 1 to 10, 10 to 20, 20 to 40, 40 plus. Uh, we're going to talk about primary stats. Some tips and tricks, uh, some nuances. Uh, I've also included weapon progression for both Alliance and Horde, for both daggers and swords, uh, as well as a slide on first aid and how to get that up to 300. Um, and let's let's just get right into it. So, before we begin, just got to quickly shout out my fellow um, collaborators on this project. These people uh, made this guide a possibility. So, Taladrill, Holex, Dis, Anubistu, Camelot, Scylla, Chaboy, and especially... Twitch streamer Dereal Marky Mark, he was incredibly helpful throughout the past week. Um, and everyone else in the various discords that uh, contributed stuff, so thank you so much, guys. Alright, so we're going to overview the class first. So rogues are generally considered to be tier 3 levelers, they're one of the slower classes to level in classic. They, other than sprint, which is on a 5 minute cooldown before you talent it, um, they don't really have any movement boosting abilities or talents, so that tends to move the needle a lot when it comes to leveling speed. They also lack self healing. They only have medium armor in the form of leather to stem damage. They don't have a pet to mitigate damage. They don't have, and one thing that's interesting is they don't have really a kiting method similar to what warriors and shamans have uh, to to trade one hit for one hit with mobs, you know, to really drastically reduce that damage. So warriors have the hamstring method. They apply hamstring and then dance in and, in, in and out of the hitbox. Uh, shamans have something similar with the earthbind totem. Rogues have to face tank most of the damage. Uh, directed at them, so it's a bit it's a bit tricky leveling as a rogue. Um, you have to be a bit calculated and precise with your pulls, and make sure you have reagents on you so you can escape with vanish or blind. Uh, they have incredibly high single target damage, especially if you're going the front stabbing build, and uh, they do have a, a wide a wide arsenal of tools at their disposal. So let's get into pros and cons. You do have one of the pros is you do have stealth. This mechanic um, is pretty good. I mean, it's not you're not going to be using it every mob. It's just not going to be worth it to to go stealth and, and, and open from stealth against every mob. But, you know, it's going to allow you to finesse certain, for certain areas, you're going to be able to bypass certain, you know, areas and complete other otherwise difficult quests you wouldn't be able to complete without stealth. Uh, rogues are pretty strong out in world PvP. Combat Swords isn't the isn't the greatest uh, greatest PvP spec, but it's still, still pretty solid. Uh, you have high single target DPS, you're excellent at escaping danger, you have high crowd control, lots of cool abilities, and uh, pretty high skill cap. So as far as the cons go, tier 3 leveling speed, low mobility, low mobility, no self heal, low sustain. Uh, you are pretty gear dependent. Having relevant weapons is going to be a big priority for you as a rogue. And you have low multi-target proficiency. So other than Blade Flurry, which is on a 2 minute cooldown, um, you don't have much. It's not like you have sweeping strikes every 30 seconds or something like that. Alright, so choosing a race. Uh, if you don't know how races uh, work in Classic, uh, all the different races have different primary base stats, and then you have, th and then depending on what class you choose, there's a modifier uh, to those base stats. So rogues is plus one strength, plus three, agi plus one stamina. So this next slide shows that modifier baked in. You can see like night elves have the highest base agility, dwarves have the lowest. Um, as far as the best alliance race for PVE, it's going to be humans uh, without question. They have the plus five skills to swords and maces. This is going to help with glancing blows. Uh, it's just going to net out to a pretty significant damage increase, and we can talk about glancing blows and stuff like that in a second. So, um, PvP, gnomes and dwarves are both equal considerations. They both have uh, different um, sort of on-demand on demand abilities that are going to allow you to get a little more finesse. So with dwarves stone form, it gives you an immunity to bleed, poison, disease, little armor, a little armor as well. Um, this is good because you can get off Serpent Sting, you can get off Blind, this is going to allow you to potentially reset in critical moments. Um, there's definitely a lot of great applications of the Stone Form. Gnomes have Escape Artist, allowing you to break snares and roots. And Escape Artist, escape artist is really good because it won't just break the slow or the, uh, you know, the, re the root portion of effect. It will, it will basically like dispel the whole effect. So that's pretty good. Um, Night Elves have the 1% dodge, but yeah. So, uh, Horde, Horde races, Orcs are going to be best for uh, PvE. They have a on-demand attack power cooldown called Blood Fury. This is going to be very useful throughout every stage of the game for both PvE and PvP. Really, really good. And uh, also for PvP, they probably have the edge even over Undead and PvP as well. 
Uh, it's pretty widely accepted that the 25% chance to potentially resist stuns is very strong. It can throw a, a spanner in the works when it comes to the, the flow of PvP combat. Being able to resist a stun at a critical moment um, can definitely you know, mean life or death. So orcs and undeads are both equal considerations. Um, they're both close as far as uh, PvP viability. Undeads have Will the Forsaken. Gives them that uh, on-demand immunity to fear, sleep, and charm. They also have Cannibalize, which is good considering you don't have much sustain as a rogue. Uh, but yeah, all right, so general leveling tips. We'll blaze through these. You guys have probably heard me talk about this stuff uh, with every class, but you want to kill mobs with the highest XP gain. So you're gonna have to do a little efficiency calculation. Um, on slides 10 and 11, you're gonna see, um, you know, what percent of a mob's base XP reward value you will be getting, whether it's higher, or lower, or equal. So you only get 100% if it's equal level of you. If you kill a mob that's even one level higher or one level lower, you will only be getting a percentage of their base XP reward value, but we can look at that in a second. Also, push the limits of your combat efficiency if you're sitting there at full full health in the case of a rogue, and you're ending the fights, um, you know, with full health, and it wasn't, you know, it, it wasn't very taxing, then push the limits of your combat efficiency, chain pull more aggressively, you know, expend more resources, health is a resource, right? Do whatever it takes to keep things regenerating and on cooldown. Find that harmonious balance between spending resources and generating them. So the next thing is be adaptive with your damage rotation cycle. Don't just take one static damage rota damage rotation at face value. You know, maybe you're going to be going up a uh, against a target with high armor, and uh, something like rupture is going to be better to use. It's going to depend on what ranks of your abilities, targets, health, uh, you know, level abilities, armor. Factor factor all this into your decision making. All right, so leveling speed equation. This. Um, may seem really simple, but I still think it's kind of valuable to talk about and break down. So your leveling speed is going to be a sum total of three factors. You're in combat time. That's the time you're going to be spending just killing mobs. Um, you know, boosting this this time or, or shaving seconds off this will be furthered by primary stats that, you know, provide attack power like strength and agility. Then you have out of combat time. This is going to be mandatory time that you need to expend uh, to regenerate through through healing, through eating, through bandaging to get yourself back into a combat ready state. You know, the, the stat values that will affect this will be stuff like spirit potentially. And then the third factor is going to be travel time. This is going to be the amount of time it takes to travel from objective to objective from point A to point B. So the, 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 the real main point I want to make with this is that sh sh uh, because the metric for success we're talking about is time, is seconds and minutes and hours, all three of these are, should be held equal, right? So if you can shave off 10 seconds of out, out of combat time versus being able to shave off five seconds of in combat time with some additional strength, uh, what's going to be better for you? It's going to be, you know, potentially spirit or whatever is going to shave off more seconds. I hope that makes sense. All right, so here's the slides I was talking about earlier, the percent XP gain per mob. As you can see, you know, especially in the early levels, killing stuff that's even one level lower, the XP... Um, kind of penalty is pretty pretty drastic like if you're at level seven and you kill a level uh, four mob you lose 60 percent xp you're only gaining 40 percent uh, of the mob's primary uh, xp value reward value so just keep it in mind this is all the way up to 60 these values are courtesy of a guy named navak he hit me up in discord and was kind enough to share this i had never seen this until a few days ago so you can show him some love in, in our community discord um really good stuff all right Rogue specific tips. I don't want to get into all of these. I put this is kind of the catch all slides of just little random juicy nuggets that may help. So I'll get into some of them. The mark of a good rogue player is efficient use of finishers. You'd use good judgment to not overkill mobs, but not underwhelm them either. And there's no add on in the world that's going to make up for this game sense. You need kind of a good, you need good judgment. You need good decision making to figure out, you know, if two points in a, if, if two point slice and dice is going to be better than three points, or just maybe one point point is going to be sufficient. Maybe only a four point eviscerate is needed in this situation. Um, but you know, that's that's the basic flow of combat for a rogue. You build up these combo points and then you expend them in some kind of finishing move. So. Yeah, you got to build up that good game sense. Gouge and bandage is your bread and butter heal mid combat. You can vanish the disjoint most spells. Um, let's see what else is useful here. Sap can't be used in combat and will break your stealth unless talented. You got to remember that that's how it was in vanilla. Um, if you have an opportunity to buy fade leaf in bulk at a good price when you can on the AH, go ahead and buy that so you can have uh, ample ample blinds at your disposal. Um, from 47 onwards, you can try and pay for a warlock or a hunter to uh, run you through Maradon, get you that blackstone ring and thrash play. That's going to move the needle a lot. At levels 53 and 55, you can try and purchase your Devil Sword Gauntlet and Leggings if you have the cash to support it. Um, 
Yeah, ideally you want a slower main hand weapon and a faster offhand weapon for faster poison application. You guys can go through this. All right, so dual wielding. Um, why is it viable for rogues to dual wield, but warriors are strongly discouraged from dual wielding while leveling? There's a couple different factors to consider here. One is the way like white damage and yellow damage is calculated. The other thing is that, you know, uh, warriors, they, they, they generate rage based on their auto attacks and getting hit right so rogues don't rogues don't it's not like that for rogues your, your energy is like a, is, it, it, it replenishes in a different way so it's not dependent on your auto attack hits and uh, when you're fighting a mob at equal level right dual wielding reduces the hit chance from five percent to 19 percent um so missing those those auto attacks and not generating that rage is going to impact you a lot more as a warrior than a rogue. And also rogues have good talents like uh, precision and stuff, which is another thing to consider. You get an extra 5% hit there. Um, yeah. All right. So if you want to learn more about glancing blows, the importance of weapon skill, uh, you know, why the plus five, uh, you know, s skill to swords and maces is good for humans. You can read this, but it's a bit of a wall of text for the video. All right. Poisons are a class profession learned by rogues at level 20 by way of a quest line. The quest line is kind of a nightmare. It is soloable for both Alliance and Horde, but you may want to uh, tear your hair out in the process. Uh, so you basically coat your weapons, main hand and offhand can use a different poison. Um, you coat them in poisons and the poisons do different things. So instant poison is going to be your default poison, a poison that you apply to both of your weapons while leveling. It just provides more, you know, consistent instant damage, better value in the long run. Deadly poison will do more damage, but it is a damage over time. I think it's like 18 seconds or something. So a lot of times you're not going to be getting sufficient value from it. It also takes up a debuff slot. And sometimes you may need a damage over time spell for whatever reason. So it's something you have in your um, in your toolkit. Mind numbing poison is useful on your offhand in PvP against casters if you do have the time to set it up. If you are intending to PvP, crippling poison on both is going to probably be optimal there. Um, so notes about poisons. Yeah, so stuff like instant poison and wound po poison, uh, it's not the type of thing where you can just get a really fast weapon and get more and more procs of them. They're, ba they're balanced around a PPM system, a procs per minute system. So whether you're using a slower weapon or a faster weapon, it's going to net out to the same damage. All right, useful add-ons. Every melee in the class should have every melee class in the game should have a swing timer that's going to be able to track, you know, the track your auto attacks and potentially your enemy's auto attacks. So this is this is you know. This is important for for a rogue because you know obviously you're gonna have to be moving you're gonna be weaving movement and abilities between cooldowns and your auto attacks, but especially from 31 onwards, which we're gonna talk about in the next slide. Once you get your sword specialization online, if you do decide to go the combat combat swords path, this is gonna be really important. But we'll talk about that in a second. So an energy tracker is also really good. It's gonna track ticks in your energy regeneration. Gonna allow you to plan. Um, plan your energy expenditure better. XP per hour tracker for obvious reasons. Outfitter is really good. I, this is something that's been growing on me a lot. If you want to swap back and forth into spirit pieces or spirit gear to um, reduce that downtime between pulls, that's a very easy, seamless way to do so. All right, so combat swords. If you do decide to go combat swords, uh, I think starting at level 31, if you go with the build that I'm recommending here, you will get your first point in sword specialization. What sword specialization does is it gives you a 5% chance when fully ranked 5 out of 5 to get an extra attack on the on the same target after dealing damage with your sword. So this can be on a, on a white hit. This can be on a sinister strike. Now, before before this point, your sinister strike is not going to interfere with your natural auto attacks. It's just it's not going to interfere with it. So you don't you don't have to like weave it in that accurately. Right, but once you get sword specialization, it, this is what happens. So, your your sinister strike can proc sword specialization. It's damage with your sword, and that will tr trigger this instant attack. But what this instant attack will do is will reset your swing timer back to zero. So if you're like seventy percent, you're 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 just auto attacking normally, like every two seconds, right? And you're like seventy percent of the way into a, uh, into your swing timer, and you're about to attack again. But sword specialization procs, you'll get that instant proc and you'll lose that 70% progress on your swing timer. I hope that makes sense, but you're going to clip a lot into your damage. So what do you do about it? Once sword specialization comes online, you use Sinister Strike right after your main hand hits, right after it connects, right after the swing timer finishes. That way, if you do get this sword specialization proc off your Sinister Strike, you won't be clipping really anything. You're not going to lose much progress because it just reset anyway. All right, we're going to talk about uh, talents now. So combat swords. Um, this is going to probably just be the most widely accepted uh, build that the, the vast majority of you guys are going to um, going to utilize here. Um, no matter what happens when, when Classic launches, this is going to be viable. It's more practical. It's decent in PvP. It's less APM intensive. And there's a better weapon progression with swords overall. The cons, it's considerably less damage than the uh, backstab build. 
Alright, so you're level 10 and you want to know the order of operations on where to invest talent points. You're going to start off with 2 out of 2, improve Sinister Strike, followed by 3 into improve Gouge. We're going to rush down to repost and get repost at level 20. Um, so you're going to take 5 into Deflection. Parry is good. It's going to give you some additional survivability. It's also going to give you a DPS increase in the form of Parry Haste. Repost is an excellent ability. Uh, not only does it deal backstab level damage with 150% weapon damage, but it only costs 10 energy and it disarms the target for 6 seconds. This is something that's going to be usable, potentially one to two times per mob so it is very very good and it's going to be your priority as soon as it comes online um, then you're going to move into precision getting a whopping five percent additional hit which is really really good then we're going to follow, follow that up with four points into dual wield specialization picking up blade flurry when we hit level 30. blade flurry you're going to use on cooldown um, uh, ASAP it's going to increase your attack speed by 20 percent it's going to allow you to cleave down an additional nearby opponent um, so definitely pick that up and use it on cooldown Right after Blade Flurry, we're going to go up and finish Dual Wield Specialization, followed by putting three points into Sword Specialization. Then we're going to put two points into Weapon Expertise. We're going to go finish off Sword Specialization, put one into Aggression, and then one into Adrenaline Rush at level 40. This is another on-demand burst cooldown. It's a five-minute cooldown. Um, it's potentially good, but it's got a long cooldown. All right, so then we're going to move into Assassination. We're going to put two into Remorseless Attacks, followed by three into Malice, followed by two into Murder, followed by one into, no, followed by Finishing Off Malice, one into uh, Improved Slice and Dice, followed by five into Lethality, and then five into Improved Poisons. So, um, Remorseless Attacks is going to give you uh, a 40% increased critical strike chance on your next Sinister Strike, Backstab, Ambush, or Ghostly Strike. It's going to happen after every mob you kill, so it's quite good. Malice, an additional 5% crit is, is very nice as well. Murder, 2% uh, increased damage against Humanoids, Giants, Beasts, and Dragonkin. It's, it's pretty decent. Uh, 1 point into Slice and Dice, 5 into Lethality, and then the Poisons is going to be the best DPS increase there. So we're back to the exciting PowerPoint now. We're going to talk about front stabbing. What is front stabbing? Front stabbing is a clever manipulation of game mechanics that allow you to backstab from the front. Now backstab is normally only usable from behind and with a dagger equipped. So this is how you this is how you front stab. You pretty much just get right on top of the mob, get as close as you can up in its hitbox, like you're basically right on top of it. If you get too close, it'll start backing up on you, so you just want to get as close as possible. And then you're going to strafe back and forth. I use A and D to just strafe back and forth. That's kind of a little sample of how, how you see on the on the left, I kind of drew it with a green line of like how far I would strafe back and forth, you know, if that was literally me in game. Um, and the, the mob starts to kind of glitch out and, 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 and look like it's sort of turning directions back and forth. And you will have opportunities. The skill will light up while you're strafing for you to be able to use it. So what I, what I highly recommend is to put backstab on scroll up or scroll down on your mouse wheel. Because if you scroll up on your mouse wheel, you're like clicking the thing like a hundred times, right? So if that opportunity to use it is there it will be used um, so you just you get right up in the face you strafe back and forth left and right and you scroll up on your mouse wheel and you're good to go you'll be able to use backstab it's pretty much that simple all right so why do you want to front stab because it's 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 kind of busted your backstab normally deals 150 percent weapon damage that's already a ton of weapon damage but if you talent into the if you talent in to improving your backstab this is what you get you get just a flat 20% more damage in the form of opportunity. It's the first, the uh, first uh, tier one talent in uh, the su in subtlety. You get 45% base crit before gear because you have the 5% before anything, and then you have another 30% from improved backstab that takes you to 35, and then you get 5% more from malice and 5% more from dagger specialization. That is absolutely nutter butters, and then you get 30% more critical damage in the form of of um, lethality. And also, you pre pretty much get another 5% hit because mobs have kind of just a base 5% chance to dodge and parry and all this. So because mobs can't parry from behind, you, you sort of are kind of effectively getting a 5% 5, 5 more hit. And then with your remorseless attacks, your first backstab every mob will have an 85% base chance to crit before any gear because of the additional 40% increase. So I hope the case has been made. Um, all right, we're going to talk about the spec now and the order of operations. Um, but So some of the pros and cons to, to this spec before we get into it. I didn't write them out here because I didn't have room. So the pros are that you do so much damage. Like, you, you do so, so much damage. The cons are that the weapon progression isn't as good with daggers. It's still serviceable, and I put together dagger progression for you guys to follow um, in the latter slides. The other cons are that it, this spec is pretty trash in PvP. It's really not that balanced of a spec. It, you're, you're pretty trash. You're not going to be able to front stab a player um so that's another consideration 
Um, and then probably the biggest consideration is that you might develop carpal tunnel syndrome. Uh, I, I recently leveled a feral druid doing like front shredding. It's it's a little intensive. It's a little intensive on the wrist, man. You might you might uh, you might start closing up. You might need to take some ibuprofen if you if you take this if you do this spec. But uh, yeah, let's get into the talent calculator. You guys ready to see a really bizarre looking uh, build? I hope you are, because we're about to, I'm about to show you right now. So we're going to start off with two points when you improve Sinister Strike. You may be wondering, Cargos, why are you getting improved Sinister Strike? I'm going to be spamming Backstab the whole time. Well, you might be right, but here's the thing. Pretty much every mob or every other mob, you might run into a situation where you're not able to get the Backstab off. The game is just trolling you, you're, you're strafing back and forth correctly, and for whatever reason, it's not becoming available to you. Now, at this point, you don't want to waste your energy ticks. So what are you going to do? You're going to dump energy with Sinister Strike. So you're still going to be using it. Um, so yeah. Okay, so then after improved Nutter Butter Backstab, we're going to go right into Assassination, pick up two points two points into Remorseless Attacks. Then right after this, we're going to go into Subtlety and pick up five points into Opportunity. I know that seems bizarre, just spreading yourself across all three trees, but just hang in there. So then we're going to go Precision. We're going to go five out of five Precision, followed by two points into Endurance. We're basically racing down to, to Blade Flurry right away. We're going to go uh, Dual Wield Specialization, five out of five. We're going to pick up Blade Flurry. Um... So right after Blade Flurry, we're going to go back into Assassination, racing down to Lethality. So we're going to go 5 out of 5 into Malice, 2 into Murder, 1 into Improved Slice and Dice, and then 5 out of 5 into Lethality. Now at this point, we're going to go back into the Combat Tree. We're going to pick up 5 more points into, no, 4 points into Dagger Specialization. Sorry, 2 into Weapon Expertise, further increasing that skill with Sword, Fist, and Dagger Weapons by 5. We're going to finish off Dagger Specialization. We're going to put 2 points into Aggression, and we're going to finish off with 1 point into Adrenaline Rush, but that is kind of inconsequential because you will be respecting at 60 anyway. So that is the spec. All right, so there's a few considerations from 1 to 10. Uh, you get backstab at level 4. If you want to do the front stabbing method, you can start doing it at level 4, just stacking up backstabs to 5 combo points and dumping them with a vis. Um, if you are not in the mood to backstab, you can just sinister strike your way to victory. That's cool too. Um, pick up first aid ASAP. Pick up skinning ASAP. Don't bother selling the uh, skins though on the, on the AH. It's just not worth your time. Just vendor them. You'll get a pretty decent return on investment with that. Uh, you want to upgrade your weapons ASAP. Even those white ones at the vendors are actually very solid and they're pretty aggressively priced. So um, I definitely recommend picking those up. The vendor weapons are pretty nice. Uh, also, use your throwing weapon. It's going to help you tag stuff. It'll help you ensure safer pulls. You're going to get your dual wield at level 10. Um, also, early on, you can uh, pickpocket stuff. I would, I would recommend pickpocketing stuff. Uh, it may seem a little gimmicky, but... Uh, the pickpocket loot table is separate, so if you pickpocket like a mob that someone else is fighting, it's not going to reduce. Uh, it's not going to reduce how much they get, but it is a best practice to kill the mobs that you pickpocket because their pickpocketing loot table will be emptied at that point. Um, but anyway, yeah, so pickpocket get a little extra money that way. Uh, buy all the ranks of skills in this bracket. It's pretty straightforward to ten. 10 to 20, you get slice and dice at 10, but it's only going to be rank 1 slice and dice, so it's only going to give you 20% um, additional increased attack speed. So oftentimes, you're just going to be able to tempo out the mobs a lot faster, and it's not even going to be really worth it to apply the, sinister, apply the slice and dice. Feel it out, though. Definitely feel it out, and if, you know, maybe one point into slice and dice. Um, you know, just putting one point, one point for the 9 seconds might be worth it for you. But again, it's just an efficiency equation you're going to have to feel out. You can, If you want to save money, which I would recommend, you probably want to skip uh, Expose Armor, uh, Garrote, and Faint at this stage. Avoid Ambush Openers as early stealth levels are weak. Uh, rush up the Repost ASAP if you're going for that Combat Swords build. So that's pretty much it. Let me see. There's not much of a difference at this uh, this stage. So from 20 to 40, you'll have Repost online now. So Repost, as soon as it becomes available, you're going to prioritize that over Sinister Strike. Um, slice and dice again it's the same kind of situation um, from 40 to 60 so at 40 you're gonna get blade flurry you just want to use this on cooldown anytime blade flurry is up use it cleave down two mobs keep going um, starting at 42 you get the second rank of slice and dice and at that point if you at that point you want to just keep it up pretty much you know you want to put it on every mob at that point, it becomes 30%, I believe. So just put one or two points into a slice and dice and keep slice and dice up, and uh, it's really going to start to shine once you get to rank two. Stat priority. So you're going to prioritize agility. It's your number one stat. Strength and stamina are about equal, followed by uh, spirit and intellect. But I do recommend, you know, if, you, if you're just out in the open world questing and you find pieces with spirit, just keep them. Keep them in your bags, and if you have an add-on like Outfitter, you're going to be able to easily swap to them. It's going to help boost your uh, boost your downtime. It doesn't really take doesn't really take much. So I, you know, keep a spirit set on hand. It's pretty much good for every class to do that. Uh, so strength gives rogues one attack power with melee weapons. Um, agility gives you 
uh, increased crit chance, obviously. You get an increased chance to dodge. You get attack power from it. Intellect helps you level up your weapon skills. Spirit increases your out-of-combat health regeneration rate, but it's pretty streamlined. So that's your priority system there. So here's some of the weapons. This is the Alliance Sword progression. You know, the early weapons, the early vendor weapons like Gladius and Cutlass are good. Uh, the quest, you gen generally quest rewards that you can get with 100% consistency are the ones you're going to want to gravitate towards. But, you know, if you can, you know, I did put the ones in dungeons in here as well. Cruel Barb, um, this is from 1 to 29, really. Going all the way up to, um, yeah, going all the way up to 60. So this is the Alliance Sword progression. Here is the Horde Sword progression. I was surprised Horde seemed to have a bit of a better uh, weapon progression than Alliance. There's some there's some real good ones though stuff like um, stuff like where is it yeah you know, sort of serenity vanquisher sword thrash blade the uh, the omen sword or whatever it's called outlaw saber is really good yeah sword of omen that's what I'm talking about so these are these are all really good considerations here's the alliance dagger progression a lot of people think dagger progression is awful. Uh, it's not as good as swords, but it's it's pretty serviceable. You can find a way to to make it work, and then you know if you're really pushing for time for leveling speed, man, going that that's what I would do personally. I would go front stab and get daggers, gold daggers all the way up. Um, so yeah, this is the alliance and horde dagger progression. Th those are all in the slides, though, right? So I'm linking the presentation down below, guys. This is a living document. Put comments in there. Help improve the resource. This is only one version of the guide. I do plan to keep these up to date, and you can always trust that you can go to that to that cloud-based, uh, you know, PowerPoint presentation, and it's going to be up to date with uh, new new information. So here's a little slide on first aid. It just shows you where to get your books or to train the additional ranks. So for horde, you're gonna get expert first aid under wraps in Brackenwall Village and Dustwallow, and then the horde trauma quest is in the Rothy Highlands and Hammerfall. Alliance is in uh, Stormguard Keep in Rothy Highlands, and then Theramore. Um, and then closing thoughts. That's pretty much it, guys. I hope you learned something from it. Um, I appreciate you. Thank you for everything you do. And uh, definitely put down in the comment section below what uh, class you want to see next. And everyone that I uh, that I uh, that that helped make this guide, please give them a follow. Please support them. They really made big plays. So thank you guys so much. And I hope you enjoy your weekend. Have a good one.